Boop. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> I would like to introduce Felix and Gregor. And the subject of their presentation, as you can see, is Cisco in the sky with diamonds. And if you have any questions, just please raise your hand and I'll bring you the microphone. Thank you. So, good morning. Nice camera. Um, yeah, uh, as uh, the, the beautiful lady already introduced us, um, we're talking about Cisco in the cloud. So, um, this is, this is probably how they see the world when they design their stuff. Um, so, um, let's, let's start with a, with a gentle introduction into um, virtualization and networking. Um, most of you will probably know all that, but for, for the few that haven't dealt with, with cloud um, environments and virtualization, essentially, the, the whole idea is your data center goes away and is replaced by another data center and you call it cloud. And in order to do so, you put like um, a folk machine into your data center. So every time you open the door, folk comes out and you say, welcome to the cloud. Um, so essentially what, what the idea here is, is you abstract your whole hardware away and then all the machines uh, become virtual and uh, you put them into uh, your virtual data center and you, know, uh, you use your hardware more efficiently than, than ever before. Uh, the thing here is that uh, when, when vendors talk about virtualization, they mean different things. So when VMware, for example, talks about virtualization, they talk about a CPU RAM storage context that is virtualized. So it's abstracted, uh, meaning that you're not running on the actual CPU, um, or you're running on the actual CPU, but not all of the time. Um, sometimes it means emulating hardware or emulating a CPU. Um, think of QEMO. Um, and sometimes it actually only means uh, telling more than one routing table apart. Um, this is what Cisco means with the uh, virtual routing context. So essentially the whole virtualization is one bit. Um, uh, virtualization actually isn't a really new thing. Um, to be precise, virtualization actually is probably older than you are. The first computers that got shipped to corporates uh, around the world were actually virtualizing already. So um, what, what we got later was computers that are not virtualized. Uh, we called them PCs. Uh, if you remember those, you Mac users. Um, and so you know, even even the um, the Intel chips, um, um, 386, and, and so on. Uh, they have virtualization built in. This is called the protected mode. Um, as you can see, you know, in, in later days and in you know, the modern age, you patent the technology and then one year later you ship it. Um, this is modern virtualization. Now, um, this doesn't have too much to do with Cisco, but I wanted to make this point because this is commonly, very commonly uh, done wrong. Uh, the fact that you have a functional isolation um, when you run a virtual machine often causes people to think they also have a security isolation. Um, this security isolation actually, in the best case, will be as good as your physical machine. Um, a VMM, like a virtual machine monitor, is primarily built around the concept of uh, minimizing traps and minimizing so-called world switches. Uh, because they're fucking expensive in terms of performance, and everyone loves performance, right? So uh, it doesn't give you additional security boundaries. It actually, in some cases, or in many cases, takes away natural security boundaries that you will have. Uh, because if you have two PCs sitting next to each other, it is very unlikely that your data magically um, you know, diffuses from one hard disk into the other. In a cloud context with a shared storage background, that might actually happen. So um, keep in mind, every time you talk about virtualization, it is no additional security layers, but occasionally you lose security layers that you got used to. Now, uh, we're here to talk about virtual networking. Uh, virtual networking being, of course, also virtualized because uh, virtual is the new cyber. Uh, no, no, forget it. Oh, cyber, I need to drink. This is a drinking game. Every time someone says cyber on a conference, you need to drink. <sighs> Anyone on stage. <laughs> because otherwise it would be too easy to exploit. So, uh, <laughs> uh, 
uh, virtual networking. So, um, on, on in a physical hardware, um, you actually have physical network interfaces, and then you decide what the fuck to do with them. Uh, usually, you connect them to the internet to serve porn. Um, in, in a virtual environment, what you have is at least a virtual switch, so in a standard um, VMware vSphere cloud, um, you, you have a virtual switch that um, you know, comes, it's called vSwitch, it essentially just um, separates different uh, virtual interfaces. But what you need to keep in mind is that you also need to run other shit over those interfaces. So not only do you do uh, your porn surfing, but you also talk to your storage backend, which is, for example, iSCSI or NFS, um, and you um, also run um, interesting protocols, uh, fault tolerance and vMotion being two of them, that have, uh, by design and in intentionally, no security properties. So if any asshole can send a packet into your fault tolerance, communication stream, then you can essentially um, influence all the uh, memory in your virtual machine that is moving from one machine to the other. Um, and there's tools around um, for two years or something that, that actually automatically does this. So um, the thing here being, that, uh, or, or the, the core statement being, um, your network separation, the different um, Ethernet communications that you have between uh, physical hosts, like the host machines, need to be really, really thought out and need to be really, really correct. Usually people use VLANs for that. So, in comes Cisco. Now, the, the vSwitch that is shipped by uh, VMware is kind of inflexible. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't have uh, many features like vulnerabilities. Um, so Cisco actually provides its own product. The, the product being the Cisco Nexus 1000 and V, or N1K as it is usually abbreviated. Um, if you happen to know a regular Cisco switch, let's say a um, 6500 switch, you know it's a big enclosure, uh, two power supplies, uh, makes a lot of noise. You put in one or two so-called supervisor cards um, that contain the main CPU, the main memory, flash, blah, blah, blah. Um, and those are, you know, kind of like the brain of the switch. And then everything else is simply line cards. So lots of Ethernet ports or whatever have you. Now, in the virtual environment, um, the way Cisco implements this is, uh, what you see here on the top is, um, is two um, ESXi uh, hosts, host machines, right? Um, and what they get is a set of five, five different uh, kernel modules into the host. So they're running in a hypervisor kernel context. And those kernel modules are called the VEM, the Virtual Ethernet Module. So essentially, they're the replacement of the line card with the many Ethernet ports, right? But then you still need your supervisor. And the supervisors are, surprise, virtual machines. And the supervisors run somewhere, either on the same host or another host. And then, you know, magic happens, and you have a virtual switch in your virtual cloud cyber. So this is all nice and fine. Um, you can assign ports uh, to different virtual machines. The, the networking can be entirely virtual, or it can somewhere go into an actual physical network, blah, blah, blah. Um, as an attacker, uh, once you have all the porn from the virtual machines, then what you're really interested in is the so-called management network. And everyone that runs a more or less larger cloud will tell you the management network is separated. The attacker will never get to it. The reason being this. This is how the management network pretty much looks like in a regular cloud. Um, it is, an, an, it is not intentionally hard to read, but uh, it, it is meant to show you how much shit is going on there. So, you know, this is one ESX, then you have vCenter. Usually you would think one vCenter, connection, ESX, management, good. No, there is a bunch of bullshit that goes on. And then the, the bigger the cloud, the more um, 
oh, we have flies in the cloud. Uh, so the bigger the cloud, the more management budget you have. Then there's, you know, there's a cloud director and blah. And um, so VMware, apart from the ESX, which is the actual virtualization uh, product, has 84 products by now. Pretty much all of the management and uh, billing and all of that. So uh, what this means to show you is uh, once you are in the management network, um, you know, rain happens. Uh, which is how we call it when a cloud dissolves. So um, let's dive into the details with Cisco Nexus 1000V family. Um, the software they run is called uh, Nexus or NXOS. Um, it was actually, um, you know, Cisco is one of those companies that buys other companies and then slaps a Cisco label on it. So this is the case here as well. Uh, this software was actually developed uh, for storage solution, like storage area network uh, devices. Um, it is, uh, the current, current version is 4.21 SV151A. Uh, don't ask me which part they increment when they release a new one. Um, and essentially what you're looking at is a, is a Manta Vista Linux based on a, a not very fresh 2.6 kernel on Linux. Um, they, of course, had to make their own shell. Um, it is called the VSH, and uh, when you connect to it, it kind of feels like a regular Cisco CLI, um, apart from the fact that, um, you know, lockout is now called exit, and, and other things uh, behave a little bit differently. Um, when you look at it from not the shell, but from you know, a actual root shell, you will see that everything except for your shell runs as root. Which, you know, um, in the last century we did that. Um, this century we usually have different user contexts for different pieces of software. Now, there's three different uh, main products that, um, that we concern ourselves. We concern ourselves here primarily with the 1000 V switch. Um, this is what I explained before. It's the cloud switch thingy with the VAM and the VSM. Um, but they also have a Nexus 1010 router. Um, the Nexus 1010 router actually contains one single binary that is compiled by Cisco, or at least contains the string Cisco. Everything else is open source. So um, the, they probably realized how bad their developers are and just said, like, whatever we download from the internet cannot be as bad as that what we write ourselves. So, you know, they essentially build a Linux distro. Um, the routing daemon they use is Quagga. Uh, however, it is not a really fresh Quagga uh, because it has known vulnerabilities. <laughs> so if you want to own this router, you just source uh, audit Quagga and uh, be done with that. There's also a virtual security gateway, Nexus Virtual Security Gateway, or VSG, which is the firewall component of that. Um, and we are going to mention the VSG one time or later. Now, if you want to research um, NXOS, obviously you're not happy with uh, the Cisco provided shell, uh, so you want to jailbreak it, right? So, this being a virtual machine, the VSM is a virtual machine. Uh, I can do anything I want. Uh, I, I can do whatever I want that I also do for a virtual machine, right? So what you do is you essentially connect the CD-ROM drive, say, please boot from the CD-ROM drive, and the CD-ROM contains a Linux, regular Linux. Because, you know, their, their Nexus shit is Linux, so you boot a Linux, then you look at the partition table, you find that partitions 5 and 6 actually contain configuration files. Um, including some very commonly used files on Linux uh, called uh, passwd and shadow. So you boot this up, you mount this uh, partition 5, for example, um, you find a, a tar gz ball um, that contains a tar file. Like, it actually contains a single tar file. Uh, <laughs> so um, once you're over this inception style of packing stuff, um, you will find that it contains all the files that you're interested in from ETC. Um, it also has a file called checksum next to it, and I was like, oh shit, it's signed. No, it's actually not, it's just the MD5 of the TGZ. Um, so, 
what you can do is you essentially just add a user. Funnily enough, you cannot just add a root user because uh, at, at boot up some magic configuration, blah, blah, happens, and your root user is going to disappear. Um, by the way, the, the whole thing, like the whole, this whole Linux actually behaves very, very strange in many different cases. Uh, we're like constantly go like, what the fuck? Oh, never mind. Um, so we actually don't know what the magic here is. So you can't add a root user, but you can actually add an INAD service. So what you usually do is you add an INAD service that uh, uses a server called binbash and, and runs as root. And you know, <laughs> um, this, is how, and this is how you get into that. Also, uh, when those machines boot up, they have a fairly long IP tables configuration. Um, and, and they have a bunch of uh, you know, Cisco secret kernel modules that they run. Um, so you can't actually just bind shit on a port and then tell it to it. Um, and you cannot simply remove the IP tables because then the device stops working. Uh, I don't know why. So um, long story short, this is pretty much um, the, the entire script for, for the jailbreak. Um, and this actually also works uh, for the VSG and the 1010 and all the other Nexus products that, that run in the cloud. And, but, you know, this is the old school FX uh, is lame solution. And, uh, of course, I do have more talented people to work with. And so here comes the Greg style uh, jab right that, that shows you also how good the software is. Well, you know, the truth is I just didn't realize it's a virtual machine. So um, I, I just wasn't able to boot a Linux and modify the config files. Um, so the, the other approach to jailbreak the device is the following. Um, it, well, it's a, let's put it this way, Cisco wants to make money. So um, you actually need to install a license file in order to operate the product. And, um, in, well, let's put it this way. In Germany, it can be illegal to reverse engineer code and to um, work around restrictions that are software imposed. And um, however, we, it is allowed to do so for compatibility reasons. And funny thing is actually for compatibility reasons, we had to look at the licensing scheme. Um, so that's where, yeah, we, we gonna cover that one later. Um, and that's actually where the second jailbreak approach started. So um, after FX jailbroke the device, uh, we just grabbed all the binary files from there, put them into IDA. And um, I wanted to see how the licensing, licensing scheme actually works. So um, not knowing anything about the platform, I would just like grab the shell, the binary, like the, the, the VSH shell, and put it into IDA, um, and start to figure out what actually happens when I say install license. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's not too hard, actually, because in the binary, you find a couple of references to external functions called lickmgr underscore something, which sounds like license manager. Um, yes, there are symbols in the binary files, <laughs> obviously, because, uh, yeah, I probably just because Cisco doesn't know how to use strip. Um, so um, the, the, the next idea you get is, okay, so maybe there is a like separate license manager module on the device. Um, so you just uh, check out the binary file. Uh, it's called lickmgr, so load it into IDA. And um, surprisingly, in the lickmgr file, you will actually find a function called lickmgr validate license, which is probably the part that does the license validation. <laughs> um, so that's, that's been pretty easy so far. Um, and that's be like, if, if I had to build a simple crack me, I would probably pick this one because it's real world. And people tend to believe that simple tutorials and crack me's and, and war games and stuff are not real world. Um, this is, well, it's more true than some people tend to think. Okay, so um, let's check out that, that lickmgr validate license function. Um, you can see, uh, no, there is no pointer. So in the first line, um, in the first line, the, oh. Okay, okay. Um, <clears throat> oh, that's, 
the red one. Um, so in the first line you see that um, it accesses a, an, an argument of the function, and that's where it stores the file name of the license. Um, <coughs> so it sets up some, some arguments in the stack. Um, it basically pushes some uh, string here, and that looks interesting. Let's see what they do. Um, they push a format string here. Uh -huh. So basically, uh, they want to build a command based on a format string. Um, here is cd as printf. It's actually as nprintf, as nprintf because uh, like introducing a buffer overflow here would be pretty silly. Um, however, introducing a command injection by calling system is totally fine. So, <laughs> what? Yes. Um, so what you want to do? Um, is you want to play with funky char characters inside license file names. Yes, that's sad Picara said. Um, that we, there is a plain command injection inside the license tracking module. Yes, that's the way it works. I was, this is how Cisco rolls. And this is how I am rolling. Um, I was like, it can't be that simple. Uh, I'm just going to give it a try. And that was my first attempt. So I, I, I thought, well, it's probably better to just create the file first. So I created the file, installed the license, and no prompt comes back. And then suddenly you hear of X shouting, hey, did you shut down the router? Yeah. And um, <laughs> so, so, so much for, for um, the licensing scheme. Um, Developing a jailbreak on top of that is for sure possible, but however, it's a bit more tricky than you might think because Cisco does elite and superior advanced input validation, um, which means they don't disallow the dollar and the braces, but they do disallow funky characters like curly braces, greater, smaller, pipe, space, and some more stuff is, is just not allowed inside, inside file names. Um, which is probably their way of doing input validation. They just go like, okay, uh, we disallow this and that, and then we can write as crappy code as we want because everything is sanitized. Um, <laughs> this is all their monkey phone, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, uh, like, you can shut down the system, it's fine, okay, but, uh, like, if you, if you actually want to obtain a shell, then you probably want to invoke something passing some arguments to that something, and that's not as trivial because you don't have any space characters. And furthermore, this, this funky curly braces trick that Bash supplies you with doesn't work either um, because there are no curly braces. Um, luckily, there is something, and I don't know if that's, is, if, if that's so widely known, but um, Bash actually, um, by default, exports an environment variable called IFS, and IFS is called input field separator. Um, they use it internally if you use the read command and stuff. Um, so IFS, no? Am I wrong? Yeah. Okay. Um, and like internally, um, IFS by default is, is set to uh, space uh, tab new line which is just a concatenation of valid input field separators that you could use. Um, so that's a variable that you can actually use. Um, so what you can do, long story short again, is this. Um, I think it, it's probably not so well readable, um, but I'll go through it anyway because it's, it's actually kind of interesting how you could do it. So uh, you just create a temporary directory in order to uh, have everything clean and set up. Um, and the first thing you do is you create a, a file that we'll later execute. Um, so inside that file, uh, we just put some commands to add a new user to uh, PassWD and Shadow. Um, so after we created that runme file, we start our actual uh, jailbreak sequence by creating a new directory. And the directory is called dollar, uh, dollar brace bash dollar ifs. Um, and now, there, if we like concatenate the next string directly to the IFS, Beth would think we actually mean a variable called IFS something. So we just add 
some undefined variable here in double quotes to overcome this. So batch, if we like now append some string here, batch is going to accept it and is going to uh, figure out that we didn't mean a variable called dollar something something, but instead we meant dollar ifs and then something. Um, <clears throat> so we cd to that directory, create a new directory called boot flash, um, which will become clear in a, in, in, in a second. Uh, cd boot flash, create the very same temporary directory that we already created here, cd to it, and finally create a new file called runme brace.lick. So um, that's so forth for the preparation. And now we can go like, okay, cd boot flash. Oh, that's all Cisco shell here, uh, if you, if you uh, didn't already figure out. So that's not bad. Um, so you cd boot flash, cd the temporary directory that you just created in the first step. And then you can say install license, this string. And actually the directory structure that we have just created inside our temporary directory um, very well reflects the directory structure that you find on disk. So on disk you find the slash boot slash directory where we actually went to here. So the, the, the first slash here is actually the trailing slash of that one, but like as we expand spaces it looks like it's actually like the first slash of directory. So that way we can invoke our file, then we can clean up, and then it's game over. A new user is added, and you can just telnet into the box, supply username and password, and as you can see, you got a perfectly fine root shell. And now you can like further explore what's on there. So I think I'll pass it over to FX now. Yeah, short interruption of the smart guy. Um, <laughs> So, why do you why do you need to jailbreak the machine? Oh, um, note to the organizers: we're running low on beer. Um, <laughs> why do you, why do you actually need to jailbreak the machine? I mean, for research purposes, that's obvious. But also, this product is so fucking broken that you actually fucking need a root account in order to work with it. Uh, <laughs> So, for example, a documented feature is called the etherizer. So, you know, if you ever worked with Cisco equipment and you say uh, debug IP all, then, you know, your box died and then you're like, meh, I just, uh, can I have a fucking TCP dump on this? Um, now you got the etherizer, which, in fact, being T-Shark. Um, but, of course, you need a very uh, convoluted command line on the Cisco shell to operate it which includes the feature of writing the PCAP file. Unfortunately, your shell runs as the user admin, the only thing that doesn't run as root, and the PCAP file is written as root, uh, and only readable by a root. <laughs> so you want to debug the machine, you need a root account in order to get the fucking file off the machine. Also, if you want to SCP things in or out, uh, it just fails. It just fails with the silly statement, uh, syntax error while parsing scp-t0. And I, this is how Cisco rolls. Um, the next thing is if you want to SSH into the machine and your open SSH client happens to be a, a little bit more modern, um, your open SSH client is going to tell you authentication failed with too many attempts. And you go like, what the fuck? Um, what, uh, it, it took us a while to actually figure this out. So what happens is, uh, dear Andreas Boke, thank you very much. Um, so what, act what actually happens is this. Um, they set the amount of authentication trials to three. However, if you have an RSA identi identity file, a DSA identity file, and an ECDSA identity file, you already exceeded the three. Um, <laughs> interestingly enough, if you Google for, the, for this message saying too many authentication trials in the context of Cisco, you will find zero, absolutely zero posts on the internet, which either means all the admins still use Telnet, well, their clients are really, really old. <laughs> anyway, this is things that you need to fix when, when you have a root account. This is why you actually need to jailbreak the machine. So, um, you know, we didn't do that out of evilness, but as a public service. Now, speaking of public services, 
um, the, the Greg already mentioned that you know there there is you know there there was actual reason to look at the licensing. Uh, we are not people that steal from Cisco. I mean, we actually own a bunch of Cisco boxes. However, uh, in this case, like there was a bug, uh, and that wasn't found by us. It was publicly announced, uh, which was even worse. Um, so this bug um, actually said, look. If you recently upgraded your virtual Ethernet module, you know, you remember that line card thing? Um, you, and you use the virtual security gateway, which is the firewall, right? Um, you might want to look at the licensing because um, you actually need to reboot a, a couple of those things. Uh, because your licensing is going to say that you paid for the virtual security gateway and you paid for the virtual Ethernet module. Anywhere you look, however, we had a slight issue in the update um, because your packets are actually not forwarded to the firewall. They're actually passed through. Um, it took them a couple of months to realize that. In the meantime, Every cloud installation in the world that had a halfway decent patch management actually ran without firewall rule validation entirely. It, this is dangerous, obviously, right? <laughs> um, and so we decided that, you know, in, in case this happens again, because Cisco has a tradition of repeating their uh, mistakes. Uh, we actually need to look at the licensing in order to provide a workaround for um, for the more aspiring administrator uh, to fix that, which correct it. Okay. So. Okay. Um, so. We further investigated this licensing situation in order to figure out <clears throat> what's actually going on there. And um, after being able to execute our evil commands and uh, just shut down the box, um, I also actually had a look at what the license manager really does in order to validate a license, like besides ex execute your commands. Um, let's look at the license file first. So a license file is um, basically a human readable representation of what the license is supposed to be. And w I removed some of the parts in order to protect the innocent, that's us. Um, so um, yeah, so there is like, uh, there is, you, can, you can supply a, a licensing server and a vendor name and, and a whole bunch of crap. Um, if you want to look, if you want to know what a valid, valid license look like, looks like, it just um, open up a Cisco manual. It will contain some, uh, probably without the real signature. I don't know. I didn't check, but uh, like that gives you the opportunity to craft licenses on your own until you realize there is this signature field here. Um, no, that's not the valid signature. Um, so, like. You see that signature field and you think, oh, okay, so probably they use fancy crypto and stuff and it's, it's probably going to take a while until you really figure out how that licensing scheme works. Um, and then you think again and the first observation you make is, wait a second, wasn't that like, wasn't, wasn't that like 12 hex characters here? 12 hex characters? That's about like round about six bytes, I guess. Um, which is, yeah, roughly, roughly. I'm not too good at, count, too good at counting, but it, it should be in the order of magnitude. So that's 48 bits. Um, we're talking about an offline attack here because it's a, it's a licensing file, so there's no need to be online in order to validate it because the, the Cisco, uh, like the, 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 VS, uh, the, the Nexus is able to validate the license offline, obviously. Um, so that's not, that's not too much for, a, for an offline brute force attack. Um, but then again, brute force is kind of lame, and also I was maybe I was kind of lazy and didn't want to write the code for it, um, so we decided not to do it. Um, but but rather we decided to uh, further dig into what the code actually does in order to validate a license. Um, so the first thing, if you want to analyze that situation, is um, this being a Linux system, you can just grab all the binaries, copy them over to your machine, copy all the libraries it uses, and it will run just fine. Uh, it, it even does run 
on a FreeBSD machine in the Linux emulator. Oh, well, uh, okay, well, we're, we're gonna hurry up then. Um, oops, uh, how did we manage to do that? Um, never mind. Uh, oh, oh, that's that's nice to hear, sir. Um, so yes, so you look at the at the at the lick track file, um, and after you copied it over to your system, you can use a debugger naturally, which isn't present on the Nexus, uh, which is something you also should fix if you like really plan to use the device. You should really get a debugger. Um, and after poking around a bit, you find a function that seems to be involved with license tracking. I will just I just let the name here. Um, and what this function does is uh, interesting. It computes the expected signature, which means they don't use fancy crypto. Um, so it just computes the expected signature and uh, keeps it in memory and just compares it to the one in the license file. And I was like, oh, <laughs> that's good. Um, so uh, that's, that's pretty straightforward <laughs> um, because now we, we could like do our elite reverse engineering on that function, but we also could just use a debugger grab the expected value out of memory and insert it into the license file. And if one of you paid attention, um, yes, there is this host ID stuff in the license, just check that file that contains the host ID. Um, so that's so much for the licensing, and uh, here we see how you can actually do it. It's a simple GDB script. Um, it, it basically breaks on that function, extracts the signature value from memory, uh, uses some elite shell and uh, AWK magic in order to uh, in order to convert it to the proper format, and uh, there you go. That's that's the signature ball you can just take, and that should be probably should be legal in most states because you're just observing what the program does, um, and it also offers an interesting opportunity to overcome future licensing problems. Let's say, okay. So, so in case Cisco fucks up the licensing again, um, this is your workaround script um, that unintentionally so also allows you uh, to research um, those devices further or uh, not pay for them. Anyway, um, so this is all nice and fine, but how do you actually use this, this switch in order uh, you know, to rain on the parade? Now, there's a number of vulnerabilities that Cisco introduced in the um, VMware vSphere environment. And the first is a classic, the famous Cisco Discovery Protocol. So VMware actually used, uh, at a single point in their code on the ESX, they actually used Cisco code. Guess what? It has a vulnerability. <laughs> um, in Cisco's own uh, discovery protocol, of course, because um, history tells us Cisco, with every new product, introduces a new field in the CDP protocol, and uh, the parsing code for that new field is going to have a vulnerability. This is pretty much true since uh, 98. So this is, again, uh, here's an integer underflow. They introduced a, a new field. I think it is called the prefix length. Um, and it runs on the ESX, and um, it runs on the highest privilege level. Um, but, you know, um, there's more. So this is actually, again, vulnerability that we didn't find ourselves, but that was recently published by Cisco, as you can see on the CVE version. Um, that says, well, the subsystem, CDP subsystem, on a bunch of devices, also not, not only virtual devices, but big boxes, data center boxes, um, has a vulnerability um, which turns out to be a buffer overflow in a device ID string. Yep, um, that's your protocol, right? Hmm. But then uh, it doesn't stop here. So um, there's encryption. You know, in a, in a vSphere cloud, everything talks to everything else, or most of the things talk to everything else with SSL. Now, um, the VSM being the supervisor module, um, and having its own storage, for whatever reason decides that there's a base set of data called the opaque data, very mystique, that needs to be stored on the vCenter server. Um, I don't know, maybe in order to force you to have a vCenter server. This is, this is what it stores there, right? So this is essentially saying which MAC address is the active VSM and all that. So it's the bootstrapping data. Uh, the vCenter API, of course, what? Yeah, we're not going to make that anyway. Uh, <laughs> the vCenter API <coughs> is um, SSL, 
and um, you know, uh, everyone speaks SSL with self-signed certificates, unfortunately. Uh, so Cisco decided to actually not check the certificate whatsoever. So if you happen to be man in the middle, then you, know, you can provide whatever opaque data you want. But now comes the interesting part. How does the VSM actually talk to the VEM? Because remember the picture I used in the beginning with the, with the 65 series switch um, with the line cards? Now, Cisco discovered that, oh fuck, now the back plane, you know, this piece of hardware that connects all the line cards is on the network. What do we do? Hmm, so they invented new protocols. Um, and protocols that they actually use in their hardware devices probably as well. It's completely undocumented. Um, it's in the debug commands and everything. It's called the stun protocol. And there's a layer two and a layer three version. The layer two version sends broadcast frames, um, 802.3 uh, broadcast frames. The layer three version uh, encapsulates the same broadcast frames in UDP. So, um, it contains the control channel, so you know, controlling the line cards, as well as a packet channel that transports important protocols like CDP, <laughs> um, IGMP, and um, LICP, and other things that they think they need to distribute between the line cards. Um, so I reverse engineered this protocol format a bit and looked at the header, and okay, so here's the protocol subtype, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the first time, you, the, the first minute you look at it, it's the subtype FTP. Wait a minute. Okay, so you have a file transfer protocol part in there. Interesting. Um, there's different formats, but then, oh, it's encrypted. It's encrypted. Um, it has one bit that tells you I am encrypted, and another bit that tells you I'm HMAT. Why exactly is the sender telling you that? Um, so, um, not very surprisingly, you set both bits to zero, and it doesn't expect you to actually have a encryption key. So, you can actually use a clear text. Um, asking the, the Cisco engineering team uh, why they did that, uh, I got the answer, literally. Um, at that point in time, we didn't really know what, to, what we were going to do with the protocol in the future, so this is why we introduced that feature. Um, so, but we still want to own the cloud, right? So the, the first thing you do when you, when you look at Cisco products is actually um, what happens when you debug shit. So of course on the ESXi host, uh, you can debug uh, the VEM. You turn on debugging on the VEM, um, and it takes literal protocol values out of a packet and indexes uh, without an array in its uh, binary which uh, is not the smartest way to do that. So essentially what happens is um, nice color. <laughs> this is how it looks like when an ESX crashes in kernel mode. Uh, that's the purple screen um, in contrast to the blue screen, meaning the same thing. Your kernel just you know, uh, puked on itself. Um, also, uh, you can essentially just steal entire VEMs from the switch. Because how do they identify the VEM on, in the cloud, right? Which VEM is it? So they use a UUID. Uh, there's plenty of identification mechanisms that you have in a vSphere cloud. However, they choose to use the one UUID that is returned to you when you, by multicast SLP, ask the entire cloud, who is the ESX server? And everyone says, here, and this is my hardware UUID, uh, which you then take and put into a little packet and send to the VSM, and then you are the VEM. Oh well, so I can become line cards, that's good. Um, I can also pull line cards with the hardest of all hacker tricks in the world, sending as much UDP packets as you can. Uh, because if you have a layer three configuration, uh, they don't actually have um, a prioritization on the receiving end, neither on the VAM nor on the VSM. So what you actually do is you essentially flood the UDP port, and on the VSM it will tell you that it just lost all the line cards. Oh well. However, um, we saw that bit that said, I'm encrypted. Now, the documentation says, this being the backplane, it needs to be encrypted, and it's 128-bit. That was it. So we looked at it, and it turns out to be AES, CBC, 
using OpenSSL code. So they actually didn't use their own AES code. Good. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> however, then you look into the driver, and it turns out the key and the initialization vector are hard-coded for every product that needs to talk this protocol, which means the entire Nexus product line. Oh, well. Um, and also, of course, they say CBC, but it's they reinitialize the key and the initialization vector every time they receive a frame, which kind of like turns it into ECB, <laughs> um, but that's, that's a minor point. Um, but then they also have this, this HMAC. Um, the HMAC is going to you know, make sure you're not spoofing anything, turning out to be half of a SHA-1 SHA hash uh, without a secret, which is not exactly how an HMAC is supposed to work. So we are now uh, speaking and reading on the virtual backplane. That has a fairly stunning impact. Uh, because being able to send and receive packets on this backplane means we can actually take over entire port groups, um, which means we get access to the management network. Um, and, you know, the management network, as you saw in this big picture, exposes a lot more vulnerable services than anything else. Um, we can man in the middle everything, because although most connections in vSphere use SSL, there's not a single known customer of VMware that actually has a PKI connected to it. So they're all using self-signed, uh, simply because there's too much hassle in setting this all up. And the only defense, the only way to actually get this whole cloud setup secure is using the layer two mode and a lot of VLANs and praying to God that none of your admins ever does a single mistake in VLAN mapping. However, the new trends, the new features that Cisco and, and VMware uh, tell you to use, uh, like VXLAN and software-defined networking all require you to use layer 3. Sorry. So, in a worst-case scenario, what happens is uh, you have a virtualized uh, DMZ with a web server, right? Uh, someone installs PHP and a bulletin board on it, and then someone else comes around and, you know, owns the bulletin board, uh, which gives you a non-privileged user um, on this machine, uploads a PHP script, um, that sends single UDP packets, uh, which talks to the switch and says, give me this port group, I need to reconfigure something, and then, you know, uh, you get a tunnel into the internal network uh, for your Chinese rat. I like that. So, um, okay, this is one product, maybe, you know, cloud is so much more. So, we looked at their storage solution. Storage solution, again, being a, you know, Linux machine, uh, um, storage area network device has web management, and then you see, like, wait a minute, you have obfuscated Perl scripts in CGI bin? Uh, when did we stop doing that? Uh, so, you know, every time we see Perl, um, you know, we give it to FTR, and FTR looks at it, so, um, I, I de obfuscated it, so it's so bad that I de obfuscated it. And he looked at it and he was like, Yeah, I see the Perl scripts, but did you see the PHP scripts? What do you think happens here uh, when it tries to authenticate the user uh, using a system exec call in PHP? Uh, yes. <laughs> so um, it should be fairly obvious that uh, your password attempt is actually um, you know, executing code. Um, as root, obviously, on this Linux machine uh, for the web management. Um, and then there's other gems. Here's another Cisco vulnerability that we saw, um, which, uh, you know, this is the Cisco Prime LAN management solution virtual appliance. So it runs in the cloud. Um, its, its main feature for us is it, it binds shells to TCP ports running as root. Uh, so you essentially just send commands and be done with that. Now, um, we talk to the vendor, right? We're responsible disclosure guys. Uh, we worked with PCERT for over a decade, um, and we reported those issues in November last year. Um, unfortunately, none of those are fixed, because the product team takes its time. The first fix is scheduled for July, which is the debug issue on the ESX. Uh, which means introducing a single if statement in their code. Um, everything else, like, 
uh, the fact that they use a hard-coded key on the backplane um, is um, now called the minimum security architecture. This is their words. Um, and they expect to release an advanced security architecture somewhere in 2014, but they still sell the product. And so our assumption is this is how Cisco's design department actually looks from the inside. Uh, <laughs> Um, pretty much that. And with that, we would like to thank you for your patience and your time.